Hello and welcome to the Glove Church Project. I'm Graham Hill. James Bhagwan is a powerful preacher and communicator, the Secretary for Communication and Overseas Mission with the Methodist Church of Fiji and Rotuma. He's passionate about calling the body of Christ to embrace the kingdom of God. He desires to see the body of Christ live out a vision for peace, stewardship of creation, human dignity, equality, compassion, generosity, dialogue, learning, and a preference for the marginalised. Aside from his church ministries, he's an award-winning radio and television producer. He's a director and writer. He combines creativity with justice, theology, creation care, and mission. James Bhagwan, welcome to the Global Church Project. You're a writer and a producer, filmmaker, and also involved in ministry in Fiji. Can you tell us something about the ministries that you've been involved in? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be, uh, be here today. Well, I um, began uh, actually studying drama. Uh, I started out of high school. I went to New Zealand and studied drama. And uh, as you can imagine, there's not much call for actors in, in Fiji. So I, I moved into radio from radio into television, uh, became the first uh, local to um, uh, direct the, the live nightly news and local programs. Uh, I had an MTV type show. You can imagine me with blonde hair and you know earrings and all that. I mean, it was 20 odd years ago, but I moved back into radio um, and was quite successful as a, as, a, as a broadcaster and as a commercial writer and producer. But after a while, um, and I've had various stints in you know, producing documentaries, working for the government uh, media institution and as an associate producer in uh, film companies, as a Christian I began to feel quite challenged by the heavy influence of basically trying to market everything. And I found myself saying, communication is, is what I see as a vocation for me. And I want to communicate the best message possible. Now, for me as a Christian, that means communicating the gospel, communicating the love of God and how people experience God. Um, and so I, I found myself being drawn more closer and closer into ministry. I went to theological college as a layperson just to improve my own understanding, my own theology. I, uh, come from a Methodist family, but also a very ecumenical family. And um, in that journey, I felt the call to ministry. Uh, I mean, you cannot spend your days and nights reading the Word of God and studying theology and not feel moved to, to do something more than just, you know, study. Um, and uh, I, I was walking home from school one day, from Theological College in Suva one day, and uh, I found myself singing... Um, the chorus, um, I am the Lord of sea and sky, and here I am, Lord, based on the text uh, for Isaiah. And uh, I realized that as I was singing the chorus, here I am, uh, I was crying because I was really responding from my heart to that call for ministry. Uh, I have served uh, in ministry in Fiji, in uh, what we would call parish ministry uh, in most places, or circuit ministry, uh, as a minister of the Methodist Church in Fiji. I've taught as a uh, lecturer at our local theological college, uh, and now I serve as the Secretary for Communication and Overseas Mission for, for the Methodist Church, which is the largest and the oldest uh, faith community in, in Fiji. You're very involved in justice-type issues. What, what are some of the issues around justice that you've been involved in? Well, in Fiji, we have had a, a difficult time in the last few years politically. And so, um, you know, the, the call to speak the truth in love and speak God's truth in love is it's lovely when everything is all good, but sometimes it's difficult when, when you are facing, you know, possible persecution and oppression. And, I mean, I consider Fiji paradise, so, you know, considering what happens in the rest of the world, it's, we didn't go through a very difficult time. But, uh, you know, talking about justice, talking about the issue of, you know, democracy being um, truly participatory, the, the need for the voices of people to be heard. And I think that's one of the important things for the church, to be the voice of the voiceless, to speak out for the marginalized. 
Um, and that is something that's very strong in, um, in, 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 my, in my faith perspective. Uh, the practical speaking, practical actions of love call us to act justly, uh, whether it is about uh, you know, reaching out to people who are marginalized, vulnerable communities, whether it is uh, speaking out about the suffering of other people in our, our neighboring countries. Um, and so I've been involved in, in, in speaking out on, on issues of gender justice, uh, speaking out on issues uh, where we need, where I feel sometimes we focus too much on, uh, you know, on the types of things that divide people rather than bring people together. Uh, you know, the issue of climate change is very important in, in, our, in our country. Uh, and in our neighboring island countries, as well as perhaps, you know, I mean, the rest of the world also, but we feel that impact very strongly. Um, and then, you know, we have issues of human rights abuses going on in our own backyard in places like West Papua, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, I think is that if you, if you, if you are connected, if you feel that you are connected to God, and, you know, you have that relationship where we are challenged to have compassionate hearts, you cannot be anything but moved by, by, by the, the struggles of people. And so I think for me that those are the main issues at the moment. Yeah. In our efforts to seek justice as Christians, how do we get better at valuing relationships? Well, I think our, our faith, our Christian faith is all about relationship. You know, it's a fact that we realize, you know, that we have a broken relationship with God, and that through Jesus we have a restored relationship with God. So as Christians, we live as restored people in restored relationships, and not just relationships that are re-established, but restored where there is a balance of relationship, where there is peace and justice, so it is a right relationship. And I think that's that's very, very important for us to recognize when there are imbalances in relationships, when there are imbalance when there is you know a power imbalance in, in relationships, when there is uh, a, a level of arrogance in a relationship that we're not being honest to each other, we're not listening to each other, we're not being open to each other. And I think that is an important aspect. And if we can take just that basic concept of living in right relationships with each other, and we expand on that with our right, well, you know, our right relationship with God, then moves to a right relationship with other people and with the rest of the world and the rest of creation. And that's the basis for me in terms of relationships. Yeah, I'm glad you raised the issue of power because so often in these relationships we don't think about how power works um, and we don't think about what does mutual empowerment and listening to voices that are not often heard look like um, or when we even when we talk about that we're not really thinking about the power dynamics that are in all of this well, I think that was something that Jesus addressed throughout his ministry and right to the point of his death and and his resurrection his you know his great commission is is all about restoring the right relationship between people and God and amongst people as well you cannot have you cannot, uh, you know, strive to have a right relationship with God if you don't have a right relationship with, with other people. And I think Jesus really establishes that and sets the benchmark for all of us. The challenge is that we, we tend to put Jesus, well, rightly so in many ways, as Lord, he's up there. But we use as an excuse to say, no, we can't be like that. But the reality is we are all called to be that way. How do we reestablish a deeper sense of what it means to love God and love neighbor? Now, it feels at the moment we've just come um, through a, an election, uh, a presidential election in the US, and it feels more and more like love of neighbour is something that isn't high on our agendas, even as Christians. So how, how do we get better at dealing with this particular issue in our social imagination? That, I think, is the key question facing all Christians around the world. We put a lot of energy into what we assume to be acts of love towards God. You know, uh, we move into you know praise and worship, and we we, we throw money uh, you know uh, out, and we give you know and we, we you know in our tithes or whatever it is. But 
The fact is that when Jesus says love of God is just like, or love of neighbor is just like loving God, that's the imperative for us, and that's the challenge. There is, in reality, no way for us to say we'll focus on the first without focusing on the second. And I think that's, we often, we often choose consciously, or sometimes unconsciously, but we make the, the choice to do the first and not the second. You know, we'll go to church, we'll, we'll do things that, are, uh, that people can see that we are loving God. But Jesus says, you show your love of God by loving neighbor. And the reality is, the question that is answered through the, the parable of the Good Samaritan is that the neighbor is the person who is most different from you. The person that traditionally may be your enemy. And that, uh, you know, is the biggest challenge that I think we face that we need to, that we are called to address as, as Christians. What's the relationship between the golden rule and simplicity, serenity, and spontaneity? You can tell I've been reading some of your articles. Yes, yes. I was trying try to understand how do you connect those things together? Well, I, you know, I, I talk about the golden rule whenever I want to remind us how big the oikos is, how big the household of God is. I come from an ecumenical family. Uh, I'm a Methodist minister. My wife is Catholic. My children are Anglican. That's in itself is probably another interview altogether. <laughs> but um, you know, and 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 you know, often we 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 use the concept of the oikos when we talk about ecumenism from an interdenominational perspective. But I also come from a, a family which has connections with Hinduism, with Islam, with. Uh, other faiths with people who are not of faith, don't consider themselves, you know, Christians or of any faith. And so uh, I remember I was talking once with the, the late uh, former Archbishop of the Anglican Diocese of Polynesia, Bishop Bryce, uh, and it was straight after a conversation on, on ecumenism. And he reminded me, he said, you know, don't forget, James, you of all people should know that the household of God is bigger than just one faith too. And that was a, you know, for I was a young minister at the time, and it was, you know, something, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about that. So the golden rule is something I use to remind, especially those who, who tend to have an exclusive look on justice and on righteousness, and sometimes on love, that remind us that, you know, uh, and from a Methodist theological point, it's what we call prevenient grace. It's there everywhere. God, God's grace can permeate through everything. And that we are all called at the very basic thing is to do good to others because that's how we want to be treated. It's about human dignity. It's about that respect. And it's interesting because some texts are about do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Some texts are looking at from the flip side would say don't do to somebody something that you wouldn't want done to yourself. I mean, the message is still the same. But for me, in terms of Simplicity, serenity, and spontaneity. Uh, that's a, a you know a catchphrase I, I often use when I sign off in my columns in the in the national newspaper back home. The fact is, whoever we are, as human beings, as creatures, we breathe, we breathe air. And if you look at the story of creation, that's how we came to life. We were made, and God breathed His Spirit into us. So the breath contains the Spirit. And we can think of whoever we are, I'm white, I'm colored, I'm rich, I'm poor, I'm of this status, I'm of this religion, all of that. But you try holding your breath for 10 minutes, and we're all going to end up from being vertical to horizontal. You know? And that's, for me, that's the simplicity of it. And when we focus on that, when we realize that you know, love is a very basic but very deep concept, and if we can live in that space, that's the serenity. And the spontaneity is the fact that we can't allow ourselves to get so caught up in here that we don't listen to the promptings of the Spirit and move as we are called, as God calls us and prompts us to move. And is that the image of the, the broken three-legged stool, where if you're missing one of these, you end up in trouble? Yeah. Um, well, in fact, the term I use is collapsible three-legged stool. Yeah. 
and um, it's a it's a tongue in cheek joke from from where I come from because we refer to in Fiji uh, the image of the Trinity is used uh, I think twice in 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 our in our understanding of of who we are as a nation. So the three legged stool uh, referred to uh, the colonial times where uh, the Europeans, the indigenous people, and the Indian immigrants uh, were the three legs of this on which the stool of uh, you know, which Fiji sits as a nation. Um, the three pillars referred to our indigenous cultural understanding of state, uh, which is what we call in Fiji and the Maknitu, the Lotu, which is translates as uh, the church or the faith and the Vanua, which is our understanding of being part of the land, you know, being one with creation, and that those are, uh, uh, when they work, when they're combined with a, a right relationship, mm -hmm. that leads to us having a, a, you know, living in peace and prosperity. And the fact that I use a collapsible three-legged stool is that I can go and sit, you know, we must be willing to go and sit wherever we are invited, and if there is no chair, we take our own or not, not to be afraid to even sit on the floor when others are sitting on a chair to draw attention to those who, who don't have a seat at the table. How do we begin to think about issues around climate change and sea level rises? Well, I think the first thing is that we, we need to, to look at things realistically. And there's nothing wrong with being a pragmatic or a realistic Christian in terms of looking at the reality. And sometimes we tend to live, you know, we follow that, oh, I'm not of this world, I'm just passing through it on my way to heaven. But we are here and we're here now. And, you know, um, I think that is one of the first things. For, for me, uh, you know, even as a Protestant Christian, uh, Laudato Si, which is Pope Francis's, uh, you know, encyclical on care for creation, is a very powerful document in, in a for I think, and I would encourage everyone to read it. It's not complicated, but he's able to, you know, bring together the science, uh, the you know, and really talk about the science of it, so that it's not just uh, you know people making up stuff. It's it's that's proven there, and he marries that with the you know with the theology, and the reality of climate change we experience every day in the Pacific, and this is, you know. How how climate change is experienced? If if people understand that, I think it will it will open more hearts. Because, for example, in Australia, climate change is being experienced as well. You've got the Great Barrier Reef disappearing. You've got you know the floods that have been happening. The, you know more intense floods. The more intense weather systems that have been coming in. Um, and just here, I mean. New South Wales earlier this year with those storm surges, you know, which took buildings and, and houses down on the coast. Um, that's part of climate change, the more intense weather patterns that we experience. And in Fiji, we've got, you know, uh, Fiji is not a coral atoll country, it's, it's, it's volcanic, and so we have high levels where people can go to, but we still experience sea level rise, uh, you know, coming in and, and people have to move. Uh, our friends, our brothers and sisters from Kiribati, who are people who not only have to think about where they're going to go and live in the future, but what that means for their, cult their culture, what that means for their, their sovereignty, what that means for the economic status uh, uh, and political status of their nation. Those are huge questions that we, we will have to address. And we're at the verge now, I and mean, we're already starting to see for the first time climate refugees and so you know we're talking about the dignity of people and we look at refugees for come from war and other conflicts climate change is also causing these these issues and so they're very important issues of justice how do we address you know how do we lower car uh, carbon emissions how do we uh, you know reduce our reliance on fossil fuel uh, and that's something you know that we, we talk about from, from a climate change perspective. But it's also about, in terms of justice, what are we imposing on these small countries that are actually 
a lot of these countries are doing their best to contribute to the fight against climate change, to the fight against global warming. But when you've got countries that have been, you know, losing land that could be used for for the planting of trees, which to you know get rid of carbon dioxide and things like that, those lands are being taken away for extractive purposes, so that you can mine bauxite, you can mine copper and gold. Uh, you know, we need to look at how we care for creation. And the reality is that often we we look at things from an anthropomorphic point of view, in a very human point of view, but we have to remember that we are all part of creation. You know, we like to look at ourselves at the top of creation. But still we have that responsibility, that stewardship for the rest of creation. And, you know, how do we how do we address those those issues as well? Mm. We're affected in our region by the, and right across the world these days, by the global movements of people, often displaced people for a variety of different reasons. Um, it, affects, it affects us so much in this region, and I wonder what your thoughts are about how we as Christians can think about our role in relationship to those displaced persons, global movements of people, and well, Australia's treatment of these peoples as well. I mean, in a technical sense, I come from an immigrant family. My, my father's grandparents were brought, they didn't come of their own volition, they didn't really know where they were going. They were brought by the British to, uh, to farm sugarcane to make Fiji a viable British colony. But Fiji is my home. But for many years, I've been treated as an outsider because I'm not indigenous. But I'm a the person who chooses to stay in Fiji rather than to migrate to better pastures. I, I choose to make Fiji my home. I choose to make Fiji my, my children's home. My children have indigenous roots to, to the land. Um, and the province that we come from just recently did the most amazing thing where they, in a traditional ceremony, they recognized the descendants of the indentured laborers as part of their tribe, basically. Um, and the understanding is that we're all God's children. We're all brothers and sisters. Now we look at the use of resources, you know, the, the excuses that are given. We don't have enough natural resources. Uh, the jobs are going to be taken away and all those things. But then we are reminded by the words of Jesus, you know, when he talks about separating the sheep and the goats. When the king returns, he will say to those people, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. I was sick and you cared for me. And the fact is that when we do it for the least among us, we're doing it for God. We're doing it for Jesus. And I think, you know, we can come up with all the excuses in the world for not doing things. And you realize how much energy we spend on coming up with excuses for not caring for people, for not opening ourselves up to receive people. But there's only one reason for us to do it. Because we have been received. We have been made citizens of the kingdom of God. We've been opened up and brought into the household. Now, if that is what we believe, why can't we do that for those who are in a practical need? And Fiji has said, you know, and when, when this was said by our, our political leaders, not one person in the country that I know of spoke out against this. They've said, if there's nowhere for the people of Kiribati to go, nowhere for the people of Tuvalu to go, we will take them. People of West Papua, well, themselves are under a lot of you know, human rights abuses and things in their own region. They said, we'll take people. The Solomon Islands said, we'll take people. And these are less developed countries than than, you know, than, than many others, than Australia, for example, with less, uh, you know, we're less well equipped to deal with these sorts of things in terms of industrialization and processing and, and jobs and all of those things. But the fact is, if, people, if it was you, that's a simple question, if it was with you, if it was you, wouldn't you want someone to welcome you, to accept you into your home? That's really all it is. You've been doing a, a bit of work recently around gender violence as well. Can you tell us something about that work and uh, what its focus is and some of the activities involved? Yeah. 
you know, um, the Pacific is predominantly Christian. And it's sad to say that within the region and Fiji is, is, is you know, high featuring, high in that we have high rates of, of gender violence. Uh, and the challenge we are facing is how do we as Christians really address that issue? Uh, and the sad fact is that people have used and manipulated the scriptures to promote the oppression of women, to justify domestic violence, to justify gender equality, to justify uh, you know, the mistreatment of children. And so within the churches we we you know we feel we cannot we cannot condone this anymore, you know. Uh, we are we are more uh, enlightened people now. We are, you know, as Christians we consider ourselves to be elevated from you know from knowing what is by knowing what is right and wrong, by knowing what Jesus wants us to do. And we serve and we follow a Lord and Master who elevated women in society, who lifted them up, who, who was not afraid to challenge the cultural, social norms of his day to empower women. And so for, for the churches, in, in many of the churches uh, in the region, this is something that we're, we're trying to address. And so we also look and see that there is a lot of work being done by you know, NGOs, international organizations like UN Women and other, other organizations, addressing the issue of human dignity in all its forms um, from a human rights perspective. Now, human rights is often sold as a very secular thing uh, when it comes to us because it's packaged that way. It comes from an institution, from institutions that, because they want to reach as many people as possible, they take the, the theological aspects out of it so that they're not saying, oh, well, you know, I'm not Christian, it doesn't apply to me. But um, the converse happens where the Christ some Christians will say, but this is secular stuff. That's not my, that's not my Bible says. Women, wives, submit to your husband, and you know the woman is made lower, and all that stuff, stuff from you know the second reading of the creation from Genesis, and all those kinds of things. And so, what we try and do is remind people of you know correct theology, correct interpretation of the Bible, challenge those who misinterpret the Bible to to suit their own needs and twist twist God's words for their own for their own way, uh, you know, for their own uh, to support their own prejudicial thinking, to, to promote their own attitudes. And this is something that the churches in the Pacific are taking very, very seriously. And so you also have organizations that come into communities and they'll do workshops and leave. But unless people, unless a lot of head exercises going on, but unless the heart is convicted, those things don't stay for very long, and the community itself don't, doesn't uh, support those ideas. And as I said, in the Pacific, you go everywhere, there's a church. In every village, or almost every village, you'll find at least one church. And the Pacific people are very spiritual. We have a spiritual way of looking at the world. And so it's very important that when we address any issue, any justice issue, We've got to come from that connection so that they say, ah, yes. Not only does it make sense out there and all of that, but it, it makes sense to me as a Christian. Then this really is what Jesus wants me to do. If there was one thing that you could say to the church today, what would it be? Don't complicate things. The message is, hasn't changed for almost 2,000 years. You know, it is love God, love neighbor. It is through our active, practical love of God, shown through our love of neighbor, that we, we show people who we are. And in this day and age of rhetoric, and there's a lot of rhetoric, and in this day and age of virtual reality and social media, practical actions of love are what people need. Feed the hungry. You know, you have a huge church, lots of people, but there are people right outside who are hungry. Where are we going in that, in that sense? 
I, I was reflecting on, there's a, you know, there's a Catholic chorus, it's, again, it's, it's based on a, on, a, on a hymn or a poem by Sister Teresa Rovilla. Uh, and, you know, coming from a Wesleyan background, John Wesley was influenced not only by the, you know, the, the English and, you know, the, what he was raised in, but he was open, he was very ecumenical in his, in his theological development. And he, he, he often, you know, related to the, to the mystics like Teresa of Avila. But very practical poem and song, you know, Christ has no body but yours. And so the message to the church is be the body of Christ. Be the, the, the practical, physical way of people encountering Jesus in this day and age. Not just through evangelism, you know, giving out of books and outreach and all of that. But this encounter is what transforms lives. And it's a simple thing. James Bhagwan, thank you for joining us at the Global Church Project. It's been a pleasure. The Global Church Project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com. On our website, you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities, and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.